Welcome back to Unit 8 of our Chemistry Matters series, Thermodynamics. By now you should have completed our Greenhouse Gases Lab and recorded your results on the data sheet available in our Chemistry Matters Toolkit. So let's head back out to our classroom so you can see if your data matches the data found by our students. Now that everyone has collected and recorded their data, let's look at it all together. I've combined your data sheets here and we've calculated the average temperatures for both teams. And this spreadsheet shows the time in minutes as well as the temperature in degrees Celsius for the various gases. And while it's helpful, it's also a good example of data that would be better interpreted in a graph. There are so many numbers that it's hard to notice trends or to compare one set of data to another. So let's look at the graphical form of these data. See, isn't this a lot better? The temperature is dependent, or it's the responding variable, and so we plot it on the y-axis here. The time is the manipulated or the independent variable, and we've plotted it on the x-axis. What trends do you notice in the data? All of the gases got warmer until we turned off the light, and then they started cooling down. That's right, Nath Krishna. All the gases showed the same general behavior. They all heated up and then cooled down as expected. But how do the four gases differ in terms of their behavior? The methane got hotter than the other gases. It must absorb the heat better. In the plain air, the control was the least of all the gases. Carbon dioxide and water vapor heat up the same amount. I wonder why I hear so much on the news about carbon dioxide when methane actually heats up the air more than carbon dioxide does. Well, even though methane is a better heat absorber, there's a lot more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere than methane overall, so carbon dioxide contributes to the greenhouse effect to a greater degree. I get why we're trying to reduce carbon dioxide now, but doesn't a lot of the carbon dioxide come from just breathing? That's a great question. There are actually several natural sources of carbon dioxide, including respiration. The concern, though, is that the level of carbon dioxide continues to increase, leading to additional concerns that our average global temperature will also continue to rise. NASA has been measuring data on carbon dioxide levels for decades and can use trapped air bubbles in ancient deposits of ice to measure the Earth's atmospheric carbon dioxide levels over hundreds of thousands of years. In all this time, the concentration of CO2 has never exceeded the line on this graph. That is, until 1950. So for more than the last half of a century, there's been a very rapid rise in the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. More information on NASA's work, including their orbiting carbon observatory that precisely measures atmospheric carbon dioxide year after year, can be found in our Chemistry Matters Toolkit. So how did you do with the Greenhouse Gases Lab? Were your results similar to those of our students? By now, you should have a solid handle on the concept of specific heat capacity. So we're ready to move on to other ways of measuring the quantity of heat transferred. The process of measuring the quantity of heat transferred is called calorimetry. You should remember the equation that relates to heat transferred to a change in temperature, which was introduced in the second video on the playlist for this unit. It shows us that heat transferred, Q, equals mc delta T, where Q is the amount of heat absorbed or evolved, measured in joules, m is the mass in grams of the substance gaining or losing heat, c is the specific heat capacity of the substance measured in joules per gram per degree Celsius, and delta T is the change in temperature measured in degrees Celsius. In order to measure the transfer of heat, many scientists use a device called a calorimeter, there are several different types of calorimeters, like this simple one I have here, but all have a common purpose, to measure the heat exchanged during a process. All calorimeters must limit the heat lost during a process to maximize accuracy. Calorimetry is frequently used to determine the heat of a chemical change, such as combustion or acid-base neutralization, as well as the heat of physical processes, such as melting or dissolving. Calorimetry has practical applications in many industries, including the food, recycling, and energy industries. A typical calorimeter has an insulated chamber that holds the reaction or system to be measured. The system is surrounded by water from which any temperature change is measured. 
The specific heat capacity of water has been defined as exactly 4.18 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. Or using standard units, 4.18 joules is the same as a unit of energy called a calorie. The assumption is made that all heat released by the sample will be absorbed by the water. Calorimetry is used to measure the calorific value, CV, of fuels, which is an important value in determining a fuel's efficiency. The calorific value of a fuel is the quantity of heat produced by its combustion. The most efficient fuel is the one that releases the most energy per gram of fuel. You can tell by looking at this table of calorific values that charcoal is about two times more efficient as a fuel than wood, for example. Georgia Power has offered to demonstrate the use of a calorimeter in their laboratories to determine fuel efficiencies of various types of coal. Using the most efficient fuels is important to our economy and to our environment. A more efficient fuel means less waste and less pollution. I'll see you back here after we explore how Georgia Power is using calorimeters to measure fuel efficiencies. There are four different types of coal commonly found in the United States. Each is classified by its carbon content. The carbon content is determined by the age of formation. They are uh, anthracite, bituminous, subbituminous, lignite. Anthracite, found mostly in Pennsylvania, is the highest in carbon content. Bituminous, which is mined in the Illinois Basin and the Appalachian Mountains, is the most used coal in power generation. Subbituminous is found in Wyoming, in the Powder River Basin, and then we have lignite, which is the youngest and lowest in carbon content. The more carbon in coal, the higher the heating value of the coal. We use a calorimeter to measure the heat content of a portion of coal. The heat content is measured in British thermal units. One BTU is equal to 1,055 joules. The Georgia Power Laboratory uses automated adiabatic calorimeters, commonly known as bomb calorimeters. An adiabatic calorimeter consists of a combustion vessel, a water vessel for measuring temperature change, a fixed temperature water jacket, and electrical leads for igniting the material to be tested. These instruments are used to determine the heat of combustion of fuel samples. Operation of the calorimeter begins by weighing one gram of sample into a crucible, then place the crucible into the combustion vessel head. We attach an ignition string and insert into the sample, then load the head into the combustion vessel body, we now insert the bomb into the calorimeter and start the automated program. During the automated program, the fuel is ignited and the heat released from the combustion reaction changes the temperature of the water jacket surrounding the sample vessel. This temperature change allows for the device to calculate the amount of heat released from the fuel combustion. Upon completion, a printout of the heat rise is produced. The BTU value helps to determine the optimal amount of coal needed to produce a specified amount of electricity at our generating facilities. A higher BTU coal will produce more energy per ton for electric generation. Therefore, a plant using a higher BTU coal would generate electricity more efficiently. That was fascinating. Calorimeters at work in the real world, helping to ensure we use energy as efficiently as possible. As you saw, Georgia Power uses high-tech calorimeters to maximize accuracy. But we can make our own low-tech calorimeter by selecting a container that's well insulated. Two styrofoam cups nestled together do a good job of insulating the temperature of what's inside. A lid will help insulate the system further. And you can monitor temperature changes by inserting a thermometer through a small opening in the lid. Many people call this setup coffee cup calorimetry. We've just seen how important the use of calorimetry is to identifying the efficiency of fuels. Let's see if we can apply what we've learned so far in our thermochemistry unit with an engineering and design challenge in which you'll develop either an efficient hand warmer or cold pack. But first, let's review the key concepts we've covered so far and then return to our classroom to get the details on our thermochemistry design challenge.
In the first video of this unit, we learned that some hand warmers and cold packs involve heat transfer that's initiated by dissolving ionic compounds in water. Sometimes the dissolving process is endothermic and sometimes it's exothermic. In the second segment, we learned the formula Q equals MC delta T. That's used to calculate the quantity of heat transferred during a process. And in the third video on the playlist, we learned that the specific heat capacity of solids, liquids, or gases determines how easily they will change temperature when heated. So now let's head back to our classroom to learn more about our thermochemistry challenge. Earlier in this unit, we developed questions about the hot pack and cold pack processes that we're going to investigate further. I paraphrased the investigative questions a little bit, but I think it'll be helpful for us to review them now. Maria and Eden, you guys proposed the question, how much heat is released or absorbed when an ionic compound is dissolved in water? So how would you go about investigating this? Well, I guess we could measure temperature before and after mixing the ionic compound in the water. And now that we know about the formula, to calculate heat transfer, which is Q equals MC delta T, we could compare Q values for different ionic compounds in the water. That's right. Instead of simply comparing temperature changes, we can discuss actual energy changes during the dissolving process. So Emily and Wyatt, you guys had a question about the properties of an ionic compound that make it soluble. How would you approach investigating this question? Well, we think we could mix several ionic compounds with water and measure any temperature changes. Now that we know about coffee cup calorimetry, I think we could use this process the best. I agree that coffee cup calorimetry would be very useful in this thermochemical challenge. We can make these homemade calorimeters pretty easily, although our measurements of heat exchange won't be nearly as accurate as those that are measured with a professional calorimeter. Styrofoam cups don't insulate perfectly and some of the heat transferred to or from our system will escape to the surroundings, the lab bench, the styrofoam itself, our hand, or even the air. So to minimize this loss, it's very important that the lid fits well and that the holes that we place at the top are as small as possible for the thermometer. We're going to conduct our experiment using our coffee cup calorimeter with the ultimate goal of designing an effective hot pack and cold pack. The hot pack should increase the temperature of 100 milliliters of water by several degrees. And the cold pack should reduce the temperature of 100 milliliters of water by several degrees. Both of these processes should happen in a short period of time. The systems you'll explore for use in a hot pack and cold pack are four ionic compounds that will be dissolved in water. As you will recall from unit seven, for an ionic compound to dissolve, the attraction between the ions and the water molecules must be stronger than the attraction between the oppositely charged ions themselves. It requires energy to separate the ions from each other, although energy is released when the separated ions are surrounded by water. The net energy change involved in the overall dissolving process, it can be endothermic or exothermic. If the dissolving process is endothermic, the surroundings, which in this case would be the water, will lower its temperature as the energy is absorbed by the dissolving process. If the dissolving process is exothermic, the solution will warm up as the heat is released during the process. You and your partner will measure the heat absorbed or released when four different ionic compounds are dissolved in water. The compounds you'll use will be potassium chloride, calcium chloride, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium carbonate. You'll be measuring the temperature change of the aqueous solution, which is mostly water, so we'll make the assumption that the specific heat capacity of the solution is equal to the specific heat capacity of water. Now let's discuss how we can make sure we set up a fair comparison. It's important to have experimental controls so that we can compare our data and minimize experimental error. So who's got some ideas? Emily? We need to make sure we use the same amount of each ionic compound or ionic solid. Very good. Anybody else? Yeah, what? And we also need to be sure that the amount of water is the same for all the tests. Those are both very good points. We also need to make sure that we add enough solid to cause a measurable temperature change. And we need to have enough water so that the solid completely dissolves. I think five grams of solid in 100 milliliters of water will work well. Can you think of any other controls we might need to have for this experiment? Yeah, Maria? Well, the solution should be stirred at the same rate, right? Yes, that's very good. The rate of stirring affects how fast the solute will dissolve. 
So it's probably a good idea for this experiment for us to use magnetic stirrers. That way we can ensure consistent stirring. Well, I have a question. When should we measure the temperature? Okay, good question. Let's think about what it is we're trying to accomplish here. We need to select a system that's capable of increasing the temperature of room temperature water by several degrees in a short period of time. And another substance that's capable of lowering the temperature of room temperature water by several degrees also in a short period of time. So with those objectives in mind, what measurements do you think we need to make? Well, we need to measure the temperature of the water before we add an ionic compound, but I'm not sure when to measure it again. Should we measure the temperature every minute? I think we need to measure the temperature more often. If it's supposed to change quickly, I think we just need to watch the temperature change and then record the highest temperature reached and then the lowest temperature reached. That's a good call. To calculate Q using our heat transfer equation, which is Q equals MC delta T, we're going to need the total mass of the solution, which will just be the mass of the water plus the mass of the ionic compound. Now remember the density of water is one gram per milliliter. So 100 milliliters equals 100 grams. We'll also need the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And we'll also need the temperature change of the solution. So I think you're in good shape to begin writing your experimental procedure. Keep your experimental goal and the controls in mind as you begin to write. Let's take a break so you can develop your own experimental procedure for this thermochemical challenge. And when we return, we'll review our procedures for safety and reliability. After that, you'll be able to get started developing your own cold pack and hot pack. 